short drive from my house and I cross over the border into a county that has the name of Surrey. Now Surrey has a reputation of being a bit of a well-to-do place. Perhaps if you've done well in the city, you move out here and buy your country pad. Perhaps a large manor house, old farmhouse, that sort of thing. That kind of thing. And perhaps that's a little bit uh, a little bit unfair because the county, uh, the, the county of Surrey also has other things going for it. Not least, it has the accolade of being the most wooded county in England. And I would suggest, for that reason alone, it's a great place to begin a search for some of the most mysterious, yet intriguing characters of history. So, I've entered Surrey just a short time ago, and it's time to begin a search for the Druids. I've parked up here on a piece of road which is known locally as the Hog's Back. Um, the reason being is because it's a great ridge in the landscape, so viewed from a distance I guess people thought it looked like a, a hog uh, in the landscape. Of course wild pigs, uh, wild boar would have roamed the land freely at, at, at those times. Um, now the, 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 this particular ridge um, is part of the North Downs. Downs is an old word for hill, so it's kind of weird really that uh, you know, you, you go up onto a down, but there we are, that's language. Um, and uh, down on the south coast we have the South Downs, and, and they're all chalk ridges, and we'll, we'll come back and, and look at that in, in a moment. Um, they were formed at the end of the last Ice Age, and um, that's an interesting time, because at the end of the Ice Age the land changed from a harsh frozen tundra um, to a sort of lush landscape of eventually thick um, often impenetrable, impenetrable woodland. Um, that changed the way the people lived amongst that landscape. So before, on these vast frozen plains just south of the ice uh, glaciers, people would have passed through here, um, coming from way out sort of west of Wales, through down across what was still a land bridge into Europe and across the European plains, following animals like um, reindeer, for example. So they would have moved um, with the herds. But now we've got thick woodland, so hunting is still going on. People haven't settled yet, but it's much more localised. Small camps, hunting in the woods around, and also um, foraging for seasonal um, fruits and berries and, and, and things like that. But ultimately, in order to move around, and they did still move around between areas that were good for hunting at different times of the season, they had to pass this through this landscape of thick, um, lush woodland, whereas before it was just plain and open. So these ridgeways, like the Hog's Back, became excellent routes, just as they are today for these people travelling sort of from Farnham, Winchester, right up through to Guildford and on to London. These became the sort of super highways um, of the day. But there was a problem. In bad, harsh weather, it was difficult to pass on these exposed uh, ridges. You can imagine what this must have been like in extreme weather. And even today, the Hog's Back is notorious um, for serious accidents during fog and, and, and poor weather. So people often found, or people often moved, just adjacent to the hill. So whereas you had these high ridges that were great most of the time, when the weather was bad, when there was, a, when there was exposure, there would often be a route adjacent to it. And wherever you see these ridge routes now, you often find a road, sometimes a much older road, sometimes like with the South Downs, you've got the A27, but there was a low road as well. So we've taken the high road, let's go and have a look at the low road and let's have a little think about how these ridges were developed, what they meant to the people, and ultimately, how is that gonna lead us in our search for people who came much, much later, um, the Druids.
I'm stood now below the ridge of the Hogsback, which our ancestors would have used in easier times, but when the weather precluded them using that higher route, they crossed close to here, where there's an ancient trackway that we'll go and look at in a moment. But we also know that they stopped here, they probably camped here in the Mesolithic, and then eventually in the Neolithic, they settled here and farmed the land, which is still going on today. And the key to why that happened is really found in the geology. The Hogsback is formed of this stuff, chalk, 65 million years old, and it's been formed by um, algae being compressed onto a seabed years and years ago, and it now forms this rather porous white rock that forms most of the South and North Downs. One of the keys with chalk, though, is natural deposits in it form into this substance, flint, and flint was the key tool of the Stone Age. But there's something else. About where I'm stood now, the ridge of the chalk meets what's called London clay, and therefore the water that filters down through the porous chalk into what's called an aquifer bubbles up between the chalk and the clay, meaning that all along the side of chalk ridges you often find springs so as well as the practicality of flint and the life-giving nature of water, it starts to take us towards understanding why the ancestors may have seen this as more than a practical site to stop, but a spiritual one. By delving into prehistory, we've seen how this landscape shaped the behaviours of those who lived off it. But those behaviours also influenced their beliefs. The village where I'm parked is called Wanborough, and that takes us into Anglo-Saxon times, so post-Roman history. So I want to fast forward to that period of time just to understand a little bit more about this place, and hopefully that will lead us back towards our search today for the Druids. Wanborough is believed to come from the two terms Woden Burr. Burr means a raise in the ground, and Woden is the Anglo-Saxon name for the Norse god Odin, the overarching god, the All-Father, if you like. And still today, the road that I had to take from where I spoke to you on the ridge down to where I've spoken to you here is called Womborough Hill, Woden's Hill. Therefore, we know that in Anglo-Saxon times, this was a highly important site dedicated to the to the, to the primary god of the Anglo-Saxon pantheon, Woden. Woden was depicted as both king and ancestor. In this 12th century manuscript held at the British Library, Woden is shown as the ancestral chieftain of the Anglo-Saxon kings. Traditionally, history has been obsessed with what we call the classical period, the period where we wrote things down, and has demonised anything that falls outside that period. So that's prehistory, the period before the Romans arrived in Britain, and then that period after the Romans left, before the Normans arrived, which we call the Dark Ages. It's, it's so scary and so bad in that period of time that it's called the Dark Ages. In actual fact, it's because nobody wrote anything down. However, we've learned an awful lot about that time, and actually it probably wasn't as dark as it sounds. But listen to this account written in 1881 of the Anglo-Saxons. Just listen to how people viewed that period of history. A religion of terrorism, evil spirits surrounded men on every side, dwelt in all solitary places and stalked about the land by night. Ghosts dwelt in the forest. Elves haunted the rude stone circles of earlier days. Charms, spells and incantations form the most real and living part of the national faith, and many of these survived into Christian times as witchcraft. Some of them, and of the early myths, even continue to be rep repeated into the folklore of the present day. Oh, I do hope so. <laughs> I've moved us forward in time to the Anglo-Saxon period to demonstrate how modern place names can give us interesting clues to the importance that a place held to our ancestors. 
Wanborough is also home to a beautifully preserved late medieval barn, built by the monks of Waverley Abbey in 1338. A seven bay aisled barn with this impressive oak beamed roof. So our story so far has told us that this place was important to our ancestors, probably from the Stone Age, and that modern place names show its spiritual connections from the Anglo-Saxon times. In between those periods is the Iron Age, the time of the Druids. I think it's important to ask the question, who were the Druids? And there's a challenge in answering that question for the reason that we view them through a great prism of a romantic revival period in the sort of 17th through to the 19th century. And those Druids were people who took inspiration uh, from the notion of this old pre-Roman history of the country. Part of that was probably quite a noble aspiration to actually understand that before the Romans came we weren't all savages running around hitting each other over the head and that was about all there was to our lives but it also fed into a sort of nationalist feeling which ultimately in the hindsight um, and viewing it through the prism of the first and second world war uh, was not a great thing but that's history it's uh, complex and um, and it's difficult these enchanting images from the Romantic period give us a tantalising glance into how early antiquarians viewed our mysterious ancestors. But the Druids themselves were an oral culture, writing nothing down, so it is to the classical texts that we turn to learn more about these mysterious priests. Julius Caesar wrote about the Druids and said that there were three classes of Druids. The bards, who were the storytellers, the keeper of the people's stories and histories. So as well as entertainers, they were more than that. They were the historians who told the tales of the people. There were the vates, who were the healers. In a time before the NHS and doctors and modern medicine, they knew which herb to pick to cure the ill that you had. And then there were the druids, who were the, the top of society the intellectuals, the philosophers. They were also the judges. They would mediate disputes between tribes. They weren't part of tribes. They could move before, between them. It's likely that Druids were also responsible for any kind of spiritual ritual that needed to take place. And it's that spiritual role, that role of providing for the spiritual needs of the people that leads us on to the next step of our journey today. I'm walking along a road called Green Lane, and Green Lane really refers to uh, any road um, that is not made up, just a, a track. And as you see, it's just the track today that uh, leads between two areas of housing. Uh, having said that, there is evidence back in history that at one time it was a metalled road, which is a slightly strange term to describe a road that has been surfaced. And it's thought, although not confirmed, that that was done in the Roman times. But this road runs adjacent to the Hog's Back. And it's likely that this trackway has been used for thousands of years by our ancestors going right into prehistory. And it's adjacent to this road that we find evidence of something that was very special to them. Evidence that this place was of a spiritual nature and moves us closer to our goal today of meeting the Druids. In 1983, two metal detectorists searching this field adjacent to Green Lane discovered some coins. Believing them to be significant, they did the right thing and reported them to Guildford Museum. But the procedure for fines in the early 80s meant the location of the site was read out in open court. This became public knowledge with disastrous consequences. Before archaeologists could excavate the site, looters descended in the dead of night and desecrated the temple. It is thought 
that on the nights of the temple's destruction, as many as 10 or 20 treasure hunters may have been present here on site. It's even believed that dealers may have been present to buy the finds directly as they came out the ground. We will never know exactly how many important historical artefacts went missing. However, it is estimated that it could be as many as 10 to 20,000 items, including many valuable coins. The British Museum is quoted as saying that the destruction of the Romano-Celtic temple here at Wombra was one of the saddest stories in British archaeological history. Despite the damage and looting, however, archaeologists in the 80s and 90s were able to find fascinating evidence of the site's historical and religious significance. The site revealed a round temple from the mid to late 1st century AD, that's the period when the Romans arrived in Britain. They also found evidence that it was replaced by a square temple in use for the 2nd century AD. Around 1,000 coins of Roman or Celtic origin were recovered, along with simple offerings such as brooches and rings. The discovery of the Romano-Celtic temples here was interesting and significant alone. It tells us so much about that transitional period, the Romans invading, how people reacted to it spiritually, and how the Romans blended the local religion, the local gods, with their own. Fascinating. But it's what they found beneath the temples that I think is most interesting. Archaeologists found evidence of a large tree they believe a venerated tree, and possibly an oak tree. I think when we put all the facts together, the location in the landscape, the history of this place that we know, and what the Romano um, Celtic temples built within this landscape of flint tools and rich springs might tell us, I think we can probably say that it's very likely this was a Druid sacred grove. It was important to those people, those Druid Iron Age priests, it was important to their ancestors, the people who came before them, going back into the Neolithic, probably Mesolithic period. And this place was also important to those people who came later. But I would also reflect the irony that I can't get up and have a good look at this site because it's now on private land. It's probably one of the most significant sites in terms of prehistory, Roman history, probably one of the most important spiritual sites in terms of the beliefs of our ancestors and yet if I wanted to go and have a look at it now I'd be breaking the law. Our journey has taken us to the point where we can say confidently that the priests of this Romano Celtic temple were either Druids or they were their direct descendants. We also know that the presence of a venerated tree on the site points to the fact that this was a Druid sacred grove before the arrival of the Romans. But what do we know about Druid sacred groves? The practice of using sacred groves is not an unusual one. There's references to many civilizations worshipping in sacred groves uh, throughout history. However, the Romans had a real issue with the Druid sacred groves and they claim that that was because of the matter of human sacrifice. The question of whether the Druids actually were involved with human, human sacrifice is a debatable one that rages on. And Professor Barry Cunliffe, who has extensively investigated the Iron Age, suggests that human sacrifice did indeed take place for religious purposes, but the Druids were not responsible for it, but because they were the religious leaders of the day, they had to be there. It's more likely that the Romans' uh, fear of the Druids was because they carried such political force in the Iron Age time, and therefore to suppress the Druids was to suppress the people. The Roman poet Marcus Aeneas Lucanus, more commonly known as Lucan, wrote this account of a sacred grove. It's worth knowing though, for context, that he just ordered one be cut down in Gaul his men, who were deeply superstitious and believed in gods, refused to cut down the oak trees that were sacred to the Druids. 
So Lucan took the axe and dealt the first blow himself. And as the sky didn't fall in, the men then fell in line and destroyed the sacred grove. I think if you destroy the worship place of another, you're probably going to need to make it out to be terrible, evil and bad. And just listen to this account by Lucan. Interlacing boughs enclosed a space of darkness and cold shadows and banished the sunlight far above. Gods were worshipped there with savage rites. The altars were heaped with hideous offerings and every tree was sprinkled with human blood. No birds or beasts dare enter it and not even the wind but the branches moved of their own accord and water fell from dark springs. The images of the gods, grim and rude, were uncouth blocks formed from felled tree trunks. Legend also tells that yew trees fell and rose again, phantom flames appeared among the trunks and serpents glided between them. No humans ever entered except the grove priests. So who was it that was worshipped at the site in the Iron Age and the Romano-Celtic period? Well, what the archaeologists found in the ground give us tantalising clues and perhaps lead us to a reasonably confident answer of that question. But in order to look at those, we need to head over to Guildford, which is a few miles in that direction, and have a look at the finds. Okay, Ooh, it's a warm one. Next stop, Guildford. Many of the finds from Wombra are housed at the Guildford Museum for safekeeping, but one find was unparalleled. Archaeologists recovered no less than three bronze chain headdresses, thought to have been worn by the clergy officiating at the site. Two of them were particularly special in that they had miniature bronze wheels attached to the top. Wheels such as this are found throughout non-Mediterranean Europe in the Celtic and Romano-Celtic period and are thought to represent the sun. The sun gods Jupiter, the Roman Sol and the Greek Helios are all examples of the mythological personification of these solar deities. The circular shape and the spokes representing the movement of the sun, demonstrating the likelihood of sun cults remaining from the days of the Neolithic people who built their stone circles and burial chambers aligned to the solar movements. It is likely, therefore, that in this sun-drenched valley in Surrey, the Druids revered the place as sacred. Much is made of the warrior-like status of the Bronze and Iron Age people, yet through necessity they were predominantly farmers, as were their Neolithic forebears. For these people, their very survival depended on the richness of the soil the sacred springs that rose from deep within the earth and the life-giving energy of the sun. It is therefore perhaps unsurprising that they venerated the ancient trees, springs and pools and that they looked skyward, worshipping a god of the sun. I think standing in front of the cabinet with that Romano-Celtic headdress with the cosmic wheel or the sun symbol on the top and looking into the plain face of that mannequin that displays the headdress in the museum is the closest we can come to looking into the eyes of those mysterious Iron Age priests, the Druids. So I hope you've enjoyed joining me on the journey today to meet the Druids. The enduring mystique and our enduring fascination with the Druids, I think in part, is due to the fact that they didn't write anything down, that they were an oral culture. And therefore, we are forced to rely on classical accounts, written accounts, by those that came into contact with them. 
Some found them fascinating, interesting, worthy of admiration, generally the Greek accounts. Others found them dangerous, barbarous, and people to be feared, perhaps as they didn't align with their own political ambitions, generally the Roman accounts. One of the reasons that I always try to big up our prehistoric ancestors here is generally because when I went to school, I was led to believe that they were all uncivilized barbarians. Whereas actually what we're finding is that was anything but true. These people had highly developed culture, art, language, and spirituality. And I wonder sometimes why were they made out to be barbar barbarous? I think the answer lies in the fact that the accounts are mainly from people who were suppressing and oppressing and brutalizing the people of prehistory in order to further their aims of imperialism and empire. And those that were writing about that period were doing so largely during a period of the British Empire. So it was very difficult for historians of the empire period to tell a truthful account of our ancestors and in doing so criticising what the Romans did with their imperial ambition when at the very same time here in Britain we were doing the same all around the world. But I am pleased that today the work of historians and archaeologists and enthusiasts on the subject are working hard to tear up that term prehistory. History didn't begin with the Romans here in Britain. And the more we find in the ground, and the more we learn, and the more we study, the more we find that those people were fascinating and certainly worthy of respect.